Hi, I'm Doug, and I want to encourage you in the study of the biblical languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. Today we're talking about a Hebrew topic with Dr. Scott Callahan, the Biblical Hebrew Infinitive Absolute. Dr. Scott Callahan, back for another episode here on studying the biblical languages. You joined us for an interview sometime back. Hope people will go back and check that out if they haven't already seen it. Uh, Dr. Callahan is the Dean and also a professor at the Institute of Public Theology. He's the host of Daily Dose of Aramaic, the author of Biblical Aramaic for Biblical Interpreters uh, with an English and a Chinese edition, the lead editor of World Mission, Theology, Strategy, and Current Issues, also in English and Chinese, and also a composer of Chinese worship songs. So he's a man of many talents and interests, serving scholarship and serving the church. And uh, Scott, we're really grateful to have you back on the program today. It's just so wonderful to be with you once again. It was great the first time, and I'm so much looking forward to our talk today. And I forgot to mention, uh, I met you at the, the Daily Dose of uh, Aramaic uh, through that at the conference, uh, the Greek and Hebrew for Life conference uh, in, back in summer 2023. But I first came across your work. My doctor father, um, Benjamin Noonan, had uh, shown me your Rethinking Biblical Hebrew Instruction in a Festria for your doctor father, George Klein. And uh, just really yes. appreciate your work. Yeah, in case people don't know about it, it's, it's this book right here. Yes, the unfolding of your so, words gives light. Yes, and so it goes beyond uh, my work, obviously, in, in giving a lot of people who, kn who know George Klein, my doctoral advisor, an opportunity to write about issues in biblical Hebrew grammar and syntax. Yes, yes, it's a great work. Well, today uh, we're going to talk about your dissertation topic, right? Uh, modality and the Biblical Hebrew Infinitive Absolute. Uh, you did your dissertation on it. You later had uh, that published. And uh, you, you've also got an article in the Encyclopedia of Hebrew Language and Linguistics. I think that's so cool that you have an article in there on modality in Biblical Hebrew. So why don't we start with defining some terms like uh, modality and infinitive. <laughs> yes. Well, you know, one of the things that happens not only among scholars, but others when they ask you what you did your dissertation on, is like, do you really want to know? Because we can talk a long time. <laughs> so here we go. Here's the, the published edition of the book, Modality in the Biblical Hebrew Infinitive Absolute. So divine, defining terms is good. So modality is the first word there. What is that? Uh, modality has meanings that are specific to different fields. So it means something different in medicine, for instance, than linguistics. But in linguistics, modality has to do with the expression of an idea in the world of potential, meaning it's not a fact. So the representation in speech or in writing about something that is, it's not like it's unreal, as in fantasy, but it's just not real. It's not realized in terms of some some action, some event, something like that. So that, that's what modality is. And modality fills human conversation. I mean, we, we may not realize it, and there's, now that we're thinking of it, maybe we'll notice it as we speak, but our, our talk, our normal way of communicating with each other is filled with modality because we shade potentiality into almost everything we say. Right. You mentioned the word reality there. Um, another way I think I've seen this referred to is uh, as irrealis, right? Like irreality. Again, not fantasy, but just not something that's been actualized in reality yet. Right. To try to express this idea rightly and not give mm -hmm. the wrong impression of unreal. Right. That's why in yes. linguistics we have this idea of the irreal, trying to have some <laughs> other prefix on there to right. make it clear what we're talking about. So irreal is something well it could be real but see right then i said could <laughs> exactly <You know? laughs> so that's an expression in english of modality and the way we do modality in english is with those helper words right it's not you may it doesn't do this. have to be that way you may do this you must do this that's right and in the languages of the world not every language has to do modality the same way english does but that's the way we do it and so right. uh, as we're talking about ancient languages like Hebrew and the relationship of Hebrew expressions to modality, of course, I'm using English to discuss it. And so right. 
you know, there's that issue of speaking across languages and in, in translation we're dealing with. But the great thing is modality is a cross linguistic concept. Right. So it's like tense. It's like aspect. So here you have modality. Those three, tense, aspect, modality, sort of go together in the analysis of the verbal systems of the world. Because the way languages express actions, so verbs, you know, actions or the other things that verbs do, like state in, in Hebrew, right. um, encoded into verbal expressions, whether it's the verb itself or helper words in English, like could, may, might, that surround that verb and, and temper our understanding of the verb, that's where modality lives. It's in the scope of the verbal idea. So when we say, you know, we should do an interview, well, we're talking about doing the interview. We should. There's this moral altness to it. Not in that moment, as I'm saying we should do an interview, I'm not saying that the interview itself is the should. It's we should do it. You know, it's the verb right. idea. Right. And you would relate this, um, I'm thinking about our beginning learners. Uh, they may come across in their textbook uh, for, you know, either for any of the languages, mood. Um, and yes. That's the same idea, right? So if you have an indicative mood, that's something that the narrator or the speaker is describing, like this is really the case, this really happened. If it's in the imperative mood, it's saying this needs to be the case and you better do it. It's that sort of thing, right? <laughs> right. Well, so I'm glad you brought that up because that's a really important point. People need to be aware that uh, different authors sometimes use these words mood and modality differently. And in fact, here we have a book, Mood and Modality by F.R. Palmer, that served as sort of the linguistic basis for the analysis that's present in my book on the infinitive absolute. But these words, if used as technical terms, tend to be used this way. Modality is the general dynamic of potentiality in human language, whereas mood is when you have a verb conjugation that's set aside to express a certain kind of modality. So the imperative mood is an actual form, that kind of idea, versus imperative modality that maybe could be expressed in a given language without the use of a special form where you right. know that's an imperative. You know, so contextually, you have other reasons for knowing it's imperative. So you right. know, an example maybe in, in Hebrew to help us ground this as far as this imperative idea. Uh, the imperative in Hebrew is only used for assertion, you know, like do it, you know, that kind of thing. The so-called positive command, if you know what I mean, not yes. for prohibition. Don't do it. The, the imperative is not used for that. And there, there are two kinds of expressions. There's one with the low particle and then the imperfect and the other is al with jussive. Right. So, so sort of like don't for, do this. D like don't do this ever <laughs> or you you will not right. ever do this and then other times don't do this in this particular situation yes so the low is kind of like the ten commandments thou shalt not mm -hmm. and all is hey don't touch the hot stove <laughs> right <Yes>. now <laughs> that, that, that kind of idea right but see neither of those are imperatives whereas right. that's kind of what we think of as an imperative a command even a prohibition in right. English so that's sort of right. the imperative mood I idea in English. It's an imperative right. modality also. It's a concept that in Hebrew we don't have a mood that's special, that's set aside for the so-called negative command. You know, the, the flip side, it's not affirming, it's negative, it's don't yes. do it, that, that kind of thing in, in Hebrew. So I, I hope that clarified it a little bit. A mood is a grammatical yes. form that expresses a certain kind of modality. Modality is the overarching concept, at least when these words are used as technical terms. So readers should be aware that some authors don't use, don't use these words in a technical sense. So you need to determine contextually what the author is referring to. Right. These are very helpful clarifications. And I, I know it's when you're learning another language, you know, it's, it's a whole other meta language to learn the terminology about <laughs> the language. And so challenging with the modality, though, um, I think I'm hearing you say, you know, we're talking about potentiality and the ways to express, uh, you know, different aspects of that. Is, is there something of a spectrum here? I think I've heard you or someone talk about like a meter of potentiality and how that can be cranked up or lowered down. Is there something to that with modality? Right. It's kind of conceptual, you know, the spectrum idea. 
and it's found in my book because you know I don't want to give up an opportunity to have a cool graphic, right? When I can yes. put it in there, a uh, a span of potential from it's theoretically possible something could happen. So it's a it's a far fetched maybe to an almost certain, you know that that kind of idea. So that spectrum goes from maybe kind of to surely in English, definitely, certainly, and that is why it's important to have a grasp on modal expressions and not to get binary with them. Meaning, go all the way to Shirley or all the way to the other side where there's very little chance, an expressed small chance that something may happen in the perhaps realm. And that's actually a problem that we see in the, use, in, in the interpretation of the infinitive absolute in English Bible translations and probably not just yes. English where there tends to be a ratcheting up of this potentiality all the way to certainty with the use of the infinitive absolute and I say that's not warranted based on my study. So I'm not, I'm not coming out and saying that um, all Bible translations are wrong or something like that because Bible translations have sort of the straitjacket of needing to produce one sentence for one sentence in the original language. It's not a commentary. Yes. So you're searching for the best way in your translation language to express something, and then the expositor then has the job of explaining beyond the translation. So no criticism <laughs> of the impossible job of rendering everything from the biblical languages into English or another modern language. But the value, I believe, of the infinitive absolute research that I and others have done is to help better understand what's going on. So as the book title suggested, modality has a relationship with the use of the infinitive absolute. So do you want to go into that? Yeah, uh, but before we do, uh, let's talk about infinitive for just a moment. What exactly oh, yes, is right. an infinitive? <laughs> yeah, the infinitive absolute is such a friend of mine, I forget that I need to explain. What's an infinitive? Explain that, you know? So an infinitive is a verbal noun. So that's, that's mixing categories, you know, for someone who's just starting off studying yes. languages. What do you mean a verbal noun? What, what about a nominal verb or something like that? You know, what, what's, what's going on here with, with talking about a noun in terms of it being verbal? Okay, so we have this thing in English called an infinitive, which in English, there are two infinitives. So to run, to be, to walk, Th this kind of idea where if you think about it, when you say that in a sentence, you don't know who's doing the action. It's like, well, it's not like you know, a mystery. It's just like that's not the idea. So to run is just that verb idea. So in a sense, we're giving a name to a verb idea. So the name of, uh, of the action that John is doing when he's running is to run. That's the name of that right. action. So, so when we look activity. up, yeah, it's 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 naming that verb idea. <laughs> okay, it is a noun because when you use to run in a sentence, it's doing a noun's job. I like to run. You know, so what is to run in that sentence? What's well, the object of liking? And objects are noun ideas. You see, so we have infinitives in English, but in Hebrew, that's probably where people um, in this audience will first run into infinitives that are different from the English infinitive significantly. Um, the Hebrew has two infinitives, which, which is odd two. until we realize that I found there, not that I'm an expert, but there are some languages in the world that have more, <laughs> more than two. Wow. So this is actually not complicated. Um, some languages, uh, per se don't have infinitives because uh, like every verb does the same job no matter what, that kind of thing. That would be Chinese. You know, there, there are no verb conjugations in Chinese. Um, so an infinitive idea in English would get rendered in Chinese the same way as any other verb. But then we have English and lots of languages only have one infinitive, but then there are languages that have more. Ancient Semitic languages in general had two. So that includes Hebrew. The infinitive construct is the infinitive that sometimes does the English infinitive job. 
Uh, plus there's this other time expression use of the infinitive construct and a, a few other uses, but the idea of to run often gets expressed uh, in Biblical Hebrew with a lamed and then an infinitive construct. So that one is probably easier to understand and often in a teaching grammar will get introduced first because of the idea of, well, let's teach something easy before we teach something unusual that's not in right. English. And then the infinitive absolute comes along. And there's nothing in English like that. So it still is a verbal noun. So this idea of there's no person gender number attached to this naming of a verbal idea. There's no tense or aspect of modal or modality attached to this name of this verbal idea, just like the infinitive construct. But its use is different, and in some cases in Hebrew, its form is different. And what an infinitive absolute does, uh, for its, its sort of famous special uses, is th there are two kinds. There's the where it's used by itself, where it substitutes for some finite verb. And when I say finite, it's all those verbs that have person, right. gender, number, its aspect, right. modality. So it's substituting, it's just standing in with that verb idea. And then the other kind that tends to show up a lot is the so-called paranomastic or tautological use, right. where it's standing alongside a finite verb with the same verbal root. And okay. so what I have in mind as I bring that up right now is it's just one infinitive, one finite verb, rather than there's another kind where uh, there are more of these uh, infinitives. But I'm just talking about that, that matchup right there, where that's the dying you will die kind of classic use right. that shows up so much in the Bible, where a person might say, well, wait a minute, you already said you will die. Why do we need this other infinitive in there if the idea is you will die? Because that, that was already expressed with the finite verb. So this is... This has been, how about that, a mystery to us, to, to we who speak languages that only have one infinitive. What's that doing there? It looks right. like it's not needed. You see, like it's right. extra. But sometimes, in some expressions, say, you will die would be expressed without it. That's just an example. Um, and right. sometimes it's there. What is that doing there? There's probably a communicative intent by yes. the author. Yes. So that's what kind of the research was delving into for that paranomastic use. And then what's the communicative intent? What's going on uh, when the infinitive is standing by itself in that independent use with regard to modality? So this idea right. of potentiality. And why would, why would these ideas mix? It's because what, what we've been saying, potentiality has to do with the expression of verb ideas. So here you have this verbal noun that's tightly associated with the expression of verbal ideas. So we would expect there's some sort of interaction with modality and the question is, what is it? And what's the significance of that? Now, before we get into those uh, details just a bit more, could you tell us, uh, are there any telltale signs? We've got these two infinitives in Hebrew. So as students reading the Hebrew Bible or working through a sample text, how do they know it's an infinitive construct or an infinitive absolute? Do they ever look identical? Do they have telltale hmm. endings or prefixes or things like that that could help? Yes. Well, usually there's no, there's no question at all. Usually it's very clear from use and form. Um, in many cases, the difference between an infinitive construct and, infin and an infinitive absolute. So let's use this traditional name, infinitive absolute, to full effect here to remember um, something, uh, a noun in its absolute state. These are not related ideas from a grammatical standpoint, but we can just use this as our trick to remember. A noun in the absolute state in Hebrew is not going to modify, you know, like in a construct state, that kind of idea. Well, right, where it would lose it an ending or something. It stands by itself. That's, that's the idea. So an infinitive absolute yeah. is not going to have any attachments except for a conjunction. <laughs> so a vav can stick on anything. You know, so that, we're not, that doesn't count. But right. you know, no preposition as a prefix, no, um, no suffix, you know, th this, this kind of idea. All right. So, and, I, and I suppose a question particle could go in front. I mean, but so that doesn't count. That's not modifying that, that word right. 
Okay, so standing by itself, that would be the inf infinitive absolute. Now, an infinitive construct can also do that. It's the minority of cases. So we'll, we'll set that aside for the moment. Infinitive construct will often have the lambda in front to express that two idea that we have in English that's just a language accident of two run. It didn't have to be that way that a lamed, which normally we think in English as we're reading in Hebrew expresses two, before an infinitive construct would be two whatever. Nice thing that helps us in English to remember that, oh, that's an infinitive construct. And then those time expressions that I mentioned with the other prepositions standing in front of an infinitive construct. So an idea here is that rarely is an infinitive absolute ever put in a position of being governed, so to speak, by a preposition. Whereas that's normal for an infinitive construct, not always. Well, what about this case, Scott, that you mentioned about an infinitive construct that stands by itself? So it doesn't have that llama in the front as the big giveaway, as the big flag raised to say, I'm an infinitive construct. What about that? And then that's when we get into, in the call form, of the infinitive construct and the infinitive absolute, we often have a spelling difference. So uh, some researchers have pointed out that this is actually sort of a telltale sign in the Semitic languages family that we're dealing with a, the Canaanite branch, that there's a spelling difference in the infinitives absolute in the base stem, the call. So n not all stems are like this, but th generally in, uh, in the call stem, it depends on if we have a weak verb class, but you have the a-o ah, situation, you know, a, a comets and a holom or holom vav to express uh, the, the vowels that set apart an infinitive absolute, whereas an infinitive construct has a different set of vowels. So that's, that's another way to tell the difference. But you, so you have this minor formal way, and then you have the use way, but there are some times where, say, in the, in the PL, you can have the same form between an infinitive construct and infinitive absolute. And by the way, the imperative masculine singular. <laughs> so what are you going to do to distinguish those? Well, it's, it's the magic word context. <laughs> so if you have nothing right. else, <laughs> then you know, do, do your contextual reading, gather your clues. It's going to come from context to be able to distinguish. Right. Okay, well, there's a, <laughs> there's a quick rundown for you guys uh, on distinguishing the uh, construct and the absolute, uh, the infinitives construct and absolute. Let me ask you, Scott, about this topic, though. Uh, how in the world did you get interested in this particular topic? What drew your attention to this? Did you notice it? Did a supervisor point you this way? How did you get here? Well, so in my Master of Divinity study of Hebrew, there was this mysterious infinitive absolute, which I had actually confused because it looks so similar with the Cal passive participle. So if you think about it, comets, shurik vav, in the Cal passive participle, you know, masculine singular, and the Cal infinitive absolute, comets, holom vav, look very similar. So I had confused that actually the first time through in learning. Um, so I took note of my confusion, and so that, that stuck the infinitive absolute in my mind. Uh, a little bit more than it might have been otherwise. And then in the doctoral studies, I started noticing in my reading of reference grammars that they tended to not be very specific in their discussion of the infinitive absolute, meaning there would be these allusive comments like, it appears that the infinitive absolute shows up often in modal contexts. Well, so I mean, that's, that's a total paraphrase right there. Right. <laughs> in that, uh, scholars know how to shroud generalities in certainty sometimes, but that's that's the kind of thing that I would notice that there wouldn't be many specifics offered to these to back up these elusive comments. So I just sort of noticed that, and that um, lack of specificity is an invitation to research. And so as I began to look into the infinitive absolute more, just exploring it as a dissertation topic. Um, th this might be helpful for someone who's doing a PhD right now. Uh, I, I found that someone had written a dissertation on the meaning of the infinitive absolute at Hebrew Union College. So I was like, no, <laughs> I put so much work into this and here's someone else has already done it. So you don't want to try to come behind somebody who's already done 
a lot of work and duplicate what they have done and come out with even just a slightly different uh, set of research findings. You don't want to do that in your research because the idea, after we get past the Master of Divinity level, we're getting to THM, we're getting to PhD, is you're training to be a contributor to yes. the field. And to contribute, you need to have something valuable to say. Why would someone read you? <laughs> there needs to be something valuable, some new finding. And there's plenty to, to, to learn yet. So I was downcast. Someone else had already gotten my topic until I stumbled across these elusive comments about modality and started thinking about it. Well, how would somebody be able to study these modal contexts and relate them to try to figure out what's going on with the infinitive absolute. So that took my reading in the direction of F.R. Palmer's book, The Red Book, I showed, yes. where I realized that his work had these handy categories of propositional and event modality, and that had actually developed and changed since his first edition. So he was more uh, grammatically oriented in his first edition, and then he was moving more into an actual cross-linguistic kind of look at modality on the same par as tense and aspect where it's not uh, defined in terms of how it might be grammatically expressed but instead as an, as an idea and then when I hit upon that I was thinking well has anyone researched that and no so I realized I realized here's an opportunity to take that invitation to research and and drive it home so um, you know I got to work on that to my horror, I discovered that halfway through that someone else was writing on the infinitive absolute. <laughs> no! At the same time <laughs> as me. So um, I contacted um, my friend now, Yuki Kim, who is teaching in Seoul and who I actually got to meet recently. This is the published version of his dissertation. It's about, let's see, the function of the tautological infinitive in classical biblical Hebrew. Now, that sounds like it's really touching on my topic, and it does, but Yuki's approach is completely different, actually, than mine, and so our works really complement each other. So I'm, I'm just thrilled whenever um, there's some citation of his book and there's mine, or, or, or the other way, right. that we've both right. been able to make a, a contribution to scholarship in this area. So it, just in talking with him, I realized we were pursuing different avenues, and so that's great. You know, yes. to, to have different avenues approaching the same sort of research topic. As you see from his title, he's only dealing with the so-called paranomastic or tautological uses, whereas I looked at all infinitives absolute that were doing a verbal job, you know, a verb-related right. job. Um, right. So there's a difference of scope there and a difference of research approach. And so there it was. There was the topic, and then it was a matter of becoming... Like, like this always happens with a dissertation, becoming the world's expert on the subject matter, looking at all the research, right. and then synthesizing that and then making a new contribution. And so, so that's, in brief, the story of modality in the biblical Hebrew infinitive absolute. <laughs> that's great. Uh, and I, I know the feeling of, uh, you know, finding some things during your research that you thought, oh, oh boy, you know, <laughs> or at the end, you know, there's this, but to find something that, oh, they're writing on the same one, but then to have the relief, okay, it's a different methodology, <laughs> and that's complimentary. <laughs> that's, I'm really glad that that worked out that way. Uh, now, when you talk about your contribution, though, you're not... Um, you're not saying that everything in the past was wrong, but one of the problems no. with the grammars and so forth was was just this this vagueness uh, to it, and you needed to prove uh, that connection with modality. Well, and, and explore not just it, and yeah, and explore and, it. And yes. the thing is that yeah. modality has kind of come into its own in linguistics fairly recently uh, as, as an area that's sort of uh, worthy of research, like tense and aspect had been before. Right. So that's an aspect right. of it too. It was it was yeah. sort of new. Yeah. And so that's right. that's helpful for research. You have these stimulating ideas yes. and you can use new research. And so that wouldn't have been available before, so to speak. Right. And, and with that you're able to do something of an interdisciplinary type of study, right? Integrating modern linguistics and also doing this this parametric, you know, I think about scholars of the past and the painstaking work they had to do if they were to be exhaustive. Uh, and how in our day we're so blessed with technology and things that, that can, can ease that. But you examined over, you know, 800 
uses, well over 800 uses of this all throughout the Bible, the verbal uses of the infinitive absolute. Yes, yes. So, um, as you and I both know, and many viewers know, a PhD is no joke. You really pour your life into research, and you want it, I mean, you obviously want to get done, <laughs> right? But you, you, you want it to be valuable. You want yes. it to be more than an academic exercise. And just as a you know personal word to viewers who may be watching who are in the throes of doctoral research and wondering where this is all going, from a Christian standpoint, I, I would suggest that if God has led you to this point, he's been sovereign over that and he's already sovereign over your future. So, you know, commit your ways to him and he'll direct your paths. Yes. Well, when you uh, proceeded on with this research, what what would you say was your guiding, your main research question? Could you tell us a little about that and just about the, the methodology you used in working through all these instances? Right. Well, I wanted to use a um, basically Palmer's analytical method of discerning are we dealing with so-called propositional modality or event modality. Um, lo looking at those kinds of modal categories to analyze the use of the infinitives absolute in Hebrew in modal contexts. And so, you know, the, that was the thing. And, and so a just criticism that some reviewers have had is how does Callahan know that this particular use of the infinitive absolute falls into that category and not that closely related category? And so that's, you know, worthy of being said. So there are times where there's some interpretive uh, leeway. I try to um, give reasons for different choices that, that I make. So there's deontic obligative modality, for instance, and deontic imperative modality. And these are very closely related ideas. And so a person could say, Scott, how can you justify separating these? So deontic imperative, do it, you know, that kind of thing, versus deontic obligative, you must do it. Well, what, what's the difference there? Well, in English, at least, we, have, we do have different expressions, don't we? You know, sure. So we do mean something different when we, when we say these things differently. So uh, what I just arbitrarily chose to do is to separate those categories. Deontic imperative is going to be when we have the assistance of the imperative mood to know that that's, what's, that's what the author is trying to get across uh, in combination with an infinitive absolute or using an independent infinitive absolute as a substitute for an imperative, as we could see from context, versus deontic oblig obligative being a must kind of idea, also discerned from context. It's not using the imperative mood. So, um, you know, th those are some methodological points that address that criticism. So, when using these cross-linguistic categories that require judgment calls, a person could make those kind of you know quibbles with my research method because there's categorization and I'm trying to use statistical analysis so that it's not just a personal judgment call about are, am I seeing something statistically relevant here? And of course, the results depend all on the statistical categorization to begin with, right? So right. there is, there's some judgment calls here, but then you step back and you say, all right, at least in general terms, are these findings helpful? <laughs> you know, are these, was the categorization reasonable? Are the findings helpful? And I think what does emerge is uh, our, our findings that do cohere with other research findings and then advance the discussion of what the infinitive absolute is doing. So in brief, Substituting for a finite verb, that's the, infinite, the independent infinitive absolute's job. And then the paranomastic infinitive absolute is acting as a means of verb focus, which we can do in English through just our, our tone of voice emphasizing the verb. I ran yesterday, you know, that kind of thing. Let's right. go. <laughs> I'm emphasizing the verb with, with my tone of voice. We really don't have much of a way of expressing such an idea in writing except sort of parroting 
what I just did with my voice with italics or bold. You know, that there's not a grammatical way in English right. of expressing that. However, it's interesting. Um, it appears that Hebrew has this grammatical way of expressing verb focus. And, you know, just sort of a quick justification of that, if I may, is that uh, it's sort of well known that the, the standard Hebrew word order, not at getting into the reasons, right, for, for it, but it's verb first. And then subject, if there's an explicit subject to be, to be uh, placed in a verbal clause, and if it's not in the verb already expressed, you know, in a pronoun kind of sense, third masculine singular in the verb. And then if there's an object, that that would come after the subject. Just in general, that's the statistically right. prevalent uh, verb, subject, object, word order of Hebrew. And then if you have uh, that as the predominant expression, and then you take the object and you place it in front of the verb, object fronting, that tends to be seen as a means of highlighting that object, object focus, so that it's that thing that we did, not that thing. You know, that, that, that kind of idea. We went to that city, not that city, or you know, whatever. It's that is right. being highlighted, the object. Well, there's not a way, is there, to f if, if fronting is the way that you're going to, to exhibit focus, how are you going to focus the verb? <laughs> right. It's at the front already. <laughs> well, you sort of front the verb in front of itself by using a copy of that verb that does not go into person, gender, number, tense, aspect, modality. It's just the verb idea. So if you have just the verb idea, say fronted, in front, if fronting is possible, in front of a, a, a certain finite verb form, well, there's your means of expressing verb focus, whatever that means, as far as its interpretation goes. Well, look, if you're doing verb focus, you've got to deal with modality, if it's present, you know, because the modality that's resident, that's expressed via context, we discern it, in that finite verb idea, well, if you're highlighting the finite verb idea, that modality needs, needs to get highlighted too. How are you going to, you know, like say, well, we're not going to highlight that part. That, that doesn't make any sense. It, it's within the scope of the verb idea, this modality. So if that verb idea is getting focused, then what's within the scope needs to be included in the consideration of the focus. So that's right. what the research finding basically is regarding what the paranomastic infinitive is doing. And that coheres with Yuki's research that he did from a more theor theoretical linguistic standpoint. And then there is the research finding of there being the major distinction in use between narrative and discourse. So sort of an, an insight in how the Hebrew verbal system and syntax works, it appears that there's, there might be some differences due to context between poetry and narrative, but it seems like there's a more dramatic difference between narrative and discourse. So we're, we're talking about um, non-poetic material in the Bible. Right. When there's reported speech, it seems right. like it's particularly rich in modal uses of the infinitive absolute. So that's interesting. Um, that coheres with findings, you know, sociolinguistically and otherwise, that it, it's our human speech, it's our expressions that tend to be, f that are live, so to speak, that are filled with modality. There's, right. there's hedging, there's potentiality, there's, you know, wh whatever the motive, whether it's politeness or a, a social subordinate speaking with a social senior or vice versa or you know, the situation can right. demand imperatives or, or whatever. These right. things are more prominent in discourse than in narrative. The very first time it shows up, uh, divine speech. And I was noticing in Jonah, too, the, the entire book of Jonah, the, all the infinitive abs I mean, there's only like three, but <laughs> three or four, but they're all in divine Short speech, book. too. <laughs> right, right. So... You know, this, this leads to the question, well, all right, 
verb focus. How, how are we going to render that in translation? So right. what tends to happen is an automatic surely. And this, I, I think this tendency, you know, you will surely die, you know, this kind of idea, is sort of goaded on by the fact in many cases it looks like it works in translation. Um, and it could indeed be the expressed, like the, the intention in you will surely die to say, look, you know, this is for real. You're going to die. <laughs> so what's a better way to say that than surely? And so a lot of teaching grammars of Hebrew will really highlight that certainty is kind of the main right. idea here. And so what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to sort of contextually come up with a manner adverb. Right. Some sort to, of adverbial intensification. Right. Uh, is what you usage. need to do. Yeah. And see that the linguistically the problem is, well, that could be, but how does that make sense linguistically? Because this is a verbal noun. It's a noun. It's not it's not over in that adverb category, you know? Right. So I mean it could, but let's test this out. Doesn't it make more sense from a linguistic standpoint that stripping away the what makes a finite verb a finite verb and just leaving the verb idea it's really more verby <laughs> than anything else you know like it's right. trying to get your attention on the verb not to characterize the verb which is what an adverb does you right. know that adverbial intensification or modification idea all right yeah because surely definitely does not fit the idea of modality because modality is potential surely is no potential it wipes away I mean like a person could say well yeah it's on the modality spectrum all the way at the end well sure sure fine but it's just ignoring the possibility that the expressed potential is different than expressing certainty and kind of the key example of this is the very first infinitive absolute in the Hebrew Bible we're talking about the Genesis 2, 16, and 17 uh, yes. story. So, from any tree in the garden, you may eat. So, the English Standard Version reliably puts a surely there. <laughs> you may surely <laughs> eat. Okay. Now, it's okay. It's okay. But see, what's the actual modality here? Well, the modality is the modality of permission. It's this mm -hmm. epistemic idea of permission. Because nobody's eating, right, when that expression is, is said, when the permission's given, the eating hasn't started. This is talking about the potential of this, e this happening in the future, and God is granting permission. You may. And right. that's a different may, in, so thinking in English terms now, that's a different may than maybe may. <laughs> that may happen. <laughs> right. No, 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 this is permission. <laughs> so we have categories right. that Palmer's work help, helped me to you know, used, so it's not me dreaming them up, it's cross-linguistic. Okay. So, if the idea is may granting permission, surely doesn't quite do what it's supposed to do in English there. You surely may. Well, that's shifting the may away from permission. You see? So it's not only getting away from potential, it's also kind of distorting the very clear modality of the finite verb. Right. So what's the solution? <laughs> well, I would say let's pull back from having surely be our reflex for um, translating the, the paranomastic infinitive absolute use, the, the manner adverb use. Let, let's, let's pull back from that. And let's say our manner adverb could actually bring distortion as it does here. Rather, let's look at the modality that's present and admit there may not be a way in English to express this rightly the way that the author intended. And that's got to be okay with us because it's a different language and we don't have right. an infinitive absolute in English. So Richard Elliott Friedman many years ago at uh, an SBL uh, paper reading, I happened to be present, just suggested, look, put it in bold. You may eat. <laughs> put it in italics. That's the best we can do in English. And he, he published that uh, years down the line. But right. um, that, that was an inspiration to me as I was thinking, right. you know, we don't have to drive towards coming up with a perfect translational solution 
because, for instance, the purpose of a Bible translation is, is to do as good a job as can be done in rendering the idea, and then an expositor comes and then explains the text. You know, that's when right. the expositional teaching and preaching even in, in church, uh, where it uh, comes to life. And so that's why I think the, uh, the work in the dissertation book serves the academy from a linguistic standpoint as well as the church, yes. because we've got some juicy exegetical possibilities here. Yes. So I really appreciate, Scott, how you're you know, bringing together both worlds here with the, the academy and the church and showing how this kind of scholarship uh, is not just something for the ivory tower, but it's something very practical that affects Bible translations, that affects our, our teaching and preaching, our, our study of the word and expounding it. And uh, I'd like to, to have you back uh, to talk about some some more examples. I mean, you, you've already given us certainly the one from uh, God's instruction there in the garden. Uh, but we want to come back, uh, if you're willing to do that, and uh, talk about more examples of the infinitives absolute in the Hebrew Bible. Sure, let's do it. All right.